Good evening, and welcome to the midweek service for Elmira Baptist Church. I, again, this is a virtual meeting. I'm at home, you're at home, and I wish we weren't at home. Uh, I wish we were meeting at the church's building there uh, in Elmira, and I trust that we'll be able to do that again very, very soon. Uh, there's a couple things you're going to want to bring tonight. Obviously, I hope you have your, your Bible. We're going to be looking extensively at some New Testament passages tonight and want to make sure that uh, you have your Bible, so you'll need that. If you received a prayer sheet, you should have received this by mail yesterday. This is uh, mine. Mine's on yellow paper. That's what I printed it out on, but you might have two pages if your printer only does two pages. And some of you use it digitally, I understand, but hopefully you've located that. I hope you have a notebook to take some notes tonight. I always try to take notes when other people speak. I took some notes this last Sunday night when Mitch McCormick was our speaker. And then, of course, you'll need a pen. There's a few additions to the prayer list. So if you don't have those things, um, you might want to get those. And I will stall for you for a few seconds. Uh, the reason we're not meeting at the church's building is because a couple of weeks ago now, Governor Newsom um, decreed, announced new restrictions all across California, particularly a, a certain subset of counties, most of them, including Solano County, basically asking um, us churches to not meet inside. So we said, okay, we'll go outside. And that's where we've been meeting on Sundays, 10 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the evening. I, I look this Sunday, it's just going to be blazing hot at 5 o'clock. 6 o'clock is still going to be blazing hot. So we'll just meet at 5 o'clock Sunday evening, and uh, there'll be a nice breeze, Lord willing, and that'll, that'll help keep us uh, cool. But Wednesday nights, we've been meeting at 7. I'm glad that you've joined me. I, I'm glad that you've joined me, and I hope that you will set aside time when the Bible lesson is done, to take time to pray, to just set aside time to pray. I hope you're setting aside time to pray every day, and it's important. So we're going we're gonna to talk more about that. And there's a couple of new requests that I will mention after the Bible lesson. Thank you for your flexibility. Thank you for your faithfulness. Flexibility and faithfulness are not opposed to each other. In fact, true faithfulness is flexible. Uh, there's this insincere uh, type of faithfulness that says, as long as it's done my way, then I, I'll be faithful. That's not really faithfulness. And I dislike doing our midweek prayer service virtually probably as much as anybody. Uh, frankly, really, really would like to be doing it um, in person rather than uh, as we're doing it tonight. But the, the Lord knows, and we're going to just trust Him. So I hope you've gathered those things, a Bible, a notebook, a pen, and the uh, prayer list. Uh, let's, get into, uh, let's get into the lesson tonight. I think it goes without saying that America is in trouble. We've got some serious problems in our nation and they're not gonna be solved the way most people think they're going to be solved. But praise the Lord, and I mean this, praise the Lord, we have the solution to the problems that America has. We have the solution, it's seeking the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let them return unto me, God says. The bad news is that a majority of Americans are unaware, dangerously unaware, that the true issue is in Americans' hearts and that we need to seek the Lord. And many of them would be opposed to the solution even if we announced it to them. So we, the Christians of the United States, not just the members of Elmira Baptist Church, but the Christians of the United States, we must be the adults in the room, as the political pundits like to say. We have to be the adults in the room. I am 
well, let me just set that. We have to be the adults in the room. We know the true God. We know that he cares about us as his children. We know that he cares about the nations, that he causes one nation to rise up and brings another to destruction. And if we want the United States to remain the beacon of hope, a nation of liberty, a place of relative peace, it's, because, it's going to be because you and I take time to pray. Now let me ask you a question. I hope this is not true of any of you, but maybe some of you have. Have you ever walked through a minefield? I mean a literal, there's anti-personnel mines that will kill you if you trip them, if you set them off, if you step on them. That type of a minefield. In 2010, my wife and I had the privilege to go on a trip to Israel. And as we were driving along, there would be areas that would be marked off, fencing with signs in Hebrew and Arabic and English that said, do not enter minefield. And I would never want to be in a minefield. Now, there are actually two dangers in, in a minefield. Minefield, of course, being set up by the enemy to prevent an assault on their defensive positions. There's really two dangers in facing a minefield. The first danger in the minefield is that we will be paralyzed by fear and won't move forward. Which again, the, in a minefield, you're assaulting the enemy's position. The minefield has been put there by the enemy to get you to stop so that you are a target, a sitting target. So one danger in a minefield is that we'll be fearful and hold back. The other danger, of course, is to uh, recklessly charge across the minefield, heedless of the dangers that are there. Our relationship, the church's relationship with the government, that's what we're going to examine tonight from God's Word and, and some of the principles that are guiding my thinking and I've talked with the deacons, so our thinking as we make decisions for Elmira Baptist Church about what to do. You're probably aware different churches are making different decisions. There's a well-known church, Grace Community Church in Southern California that has made a different decision than we have. Uh, I went to the Lancaster Baptist Church site. They have, a, again, a huge congregation, thousands of people that come every Sunday to see uh, how they're responding to Governor Newsom's um, mandates, just talking with other local pastors. A lot of different approaches to this. Our enemy, Satan, our enemy is not the government. Our enemy is Satan. And he wants us to either be fearful and hold back and not press on, or he wants us to just recklessly charge across that minefield in an effort to blow ourselves up. Either way, our enemy does not want us to go forward carefully. He wants us to rush forward precipitously or, or hold back. I have a quote from William Carey. He said, There are grave difficulties on every hand, and more are looming ahead, Therefore, we must go forward. And I say to you, Elmira Baptist Church must go forward. But we need to go forward on our knees. We need to go forward prayerfully and carefully. Not just waving our fist in the air and I don't care what anyone says. We're going to do what we want to do. That's the precipitous run across the minefield. Hope we don't step on a mine attitude. Matthew 16, 18 says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against Jesus' church. And it is Jesus' church. It's not Scott's church. It's not your church. I guess we claim it as our church. I understand that. But this church, Elmira Baptist Church, belongs to Jesus Christ. And he wants us to continue to march forward, 
minefield or not. But we need to be careful how we handle this. So let's talk about some basics. All the Christians whom I know and whom I respect agree on these following issues. First of all, that the New Testament word that's translated church in English, the Greek word in the New Testament that's translated church in your English Bible means a called out assembly. A called out assembly. So a church that never assembles is not a church. Now, you, the Bible doesn't say we have to assemble every week. Uh, it doesn't say we have to assemble once a month in order to stay at church, once a year. But we do need to assemble. And back in March, when we first approached this pandemic, and uh, it was a, a federal uh, thing then, uh, all groups larger than 10 need to stop meeting, that type of thing. Um, and, and we can talk about the politics. I'm, I'm purposely, purposefully leaving politics out of this. That'd be a great conversation I'd love to have with you, but I want to focus tonight on what God's Word says. Back in March, when these first mandates came down, we didn't know what the pandemic looked like. And it seemed reckless to charge into the minefield, and we thought, give, us, give the government two or three weeks, they'll figure some of these things out, and then we'll go back to meeting in a safe group. And as you know, it took over two months before we began to meet again. So when the latest mandates came down asking us not to meet inside, immediately, in fact, it was a deacon who, who really uh, urged, let's keep meeting. We'll just have to do it outside. And I, I readily agreed because I don't want to quit meeting again. Now, virtual meetings are nice, but it's just not the same. So we do want to meet. Now, that's as a church that we're called to meet, to assemble. Otherwise, we aren't a church. I have friends in Mongolia, nice people, loving people. They're Christians. I'll see them in heaven, but we are not a church because we never get together. I've got family and friends in Oregon, and, and they're Christians, and I'll see them in heaven, but we never get together. We are not a church. You and I, we'll see each other eye to eye this Sunday, Lord willing. We are Elmira Baptist Church. And as individuals, we are commanded not to forsake assembling together. Let me just remind us by reading to us Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. And this again is directed to individuals. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. It's obvious to all of us, we, we know that each day brings us a, a day closer to the return of Jesus Christ, but I think it's only obvious to state that unless the Lord sends a revival and a renewal of His people, it just does not seem that it can be that long before the Lord's return. So believing that, so much the more as you see the day approaching, it seems like we shouldn't meet less, but indeed we should meet more. And there's a fourth thing that all Christians I know and respect agree on, and that is historically churches have met under more difficult and more dangerous conditions than we currently face. Uh, during the pandemic that we call the Spanish flu, 1918, 1919, even extending into 1920, Yes, some churches quit meeting temporarily, but even during the middle of that, they, they didn't quit meeting for two years. Churches in the USSR and the Eastern Bloc during the Cold War, they faced persecution. They faced death. They faced ex internal exile. They faced imprisonment, the loss of their jobs, their place in the community, and yet they continued to meet. Today, our brothers and sisters in places like Saudi Arabia, we had a family from our church, members of our church, travel to a, an Arabian nation and meet with Christians that weren't supposed to be meeting by decree of the government. So historically, and even to today, 
uh, churches have continued to meet under more dangerous and more difficult circumstances. And here's the fifth thing that I would say, not all Christians would agree with me on this, but here's the fifth thing that I would say, and that is listening online, meeting virtually like this is not the same as assembling. I could meet with my Mongolian friends in uh, Mongolia this way, and we could have a, a Bible study together, virtual Bible study, you know, online. That would be nice. They might like that. If you're interested, uh, let me know. <laughs> but that isn't a church. We do need to assemble person, in person. There's a misunderstanding in our society that we can overcome just about any problem with the right technology, and I disagree with that. Certain problems cannot be overcome with technology. Now, let me illustrate this um, with, a, with a personal story. Back in 2003, uh, my wife was expecting Elsie, and I had a contract to teach between September in June of 2000, September of 2002 to June of 2003, but the medical situation in Mongolia was not very stable and we'd had some difficulties with other deliveries, so we made the decision to bring Christy back to the United States in February of 2003 and then leave our children and Christy with my in-laws while I traveled back to Mongolia to teach. Now I called them regularly. This was before it was easy for me to video chat, but I called them regularly. We talked regularly, but boy was I glad when I was able to leave Mongolia and return to the United States and be reunited with my family in the same geographic location. And I feel the same way about this church. I'm staring right now at a camera. I've got a couple of family members sitting over there and they're nice. They're very, very nice people, but this is not a meeting of the church. This is just a, a stopgap measure so that we continue to, to hold this evening, Wednesday evening, as a special evening of the week until we can meet again in person. And maybe we should meet outside of Wednesday nights. I should probably give that some more thought, but I, I don't want to lose this evening. Um, there are reasons why this evening would be nice for me to just step aside and just do something else. But I don't want to lose this, this evening where, we're, where, we're, where we set aside an evening to study God's Word together and to pray. So given that, the question is, how do we continue to assemble safely, remaining considerate of one another, because we certainly don't want to be a vector for the spread of COVID-19 or any other disease, and also considerate of the earthly authorities that God has set up? I mean... Why is Governor Newsom governor of California? Well, majority of Californians voted for him. That's true, but Romans 13 also tells us that God is the one who put him there. Let me give you three problems that I want to address. And if you would uh, be turning to Romans chapter 8, because that's where we're headed next. Let me give you three problems that we need to address. When it comes to responding to Governor Newsom. And this would go for churches across the United States. Uh, our, our friends in Oregon, they have a different set of rules that they're trying to follow. And uh, churches in, in uh, New York maybe have a different set. I, I don't know what all the rules are. I'm talking about California, but trying to apply it in general. How does a church respond to requirements, to rules that the government puts on them? What is the proper response? And in Thinking of that, there are three problems that I want to address, three dangers that I see here, that I'm seeing with my own eyes, three dangers. Here's the first danger. Here's the first danger in responding to the government. The first danger is we don't want to embrace victimhood. We don't want to embrace victimhood as so many who practice what we call identity politics like to do. It bothers me when Christians uh, take Governor Newsom's order personally, as if Governor Newsom is, is doing his best to make our lives hard. He just hates Christians, and he just doesn't like us, and he just wants to make us, and, and we're being persecuted. Listen, listen. 
Number one, to embrace victimhood is to accept the premise of the world, not of the Bible, to accept the premise of the world that oppression is the main problem and that we are some oppressed minority. We don't embrace victimhood. And the reason is given to us in Romans chapter 8. Look with me at verse 37. God says this, Romans 8, 37, Nay, he's just listed that they're accounted, we're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. People just want to kill us, Paul said. God says this, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. As Christians, we are never victims of our circumstances. We are always victors in Christ. And I don't want us to look at what Governor Newsom is doing, any other authority in our life, if it was our local county board of supervisors, our local sheriff or whoever, and say, we're just victims and people hate us. No, we are victors in Christ. Verse 31, Romans 8, 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? That's the attitude that Christians ought to have. Not one of, I'm the victim and people are so mean to me. But in Christ, we are always triumphant. Now, the triumph may not be seen by the world. The martyrs who were thrown to the lions by the Romans, boy, the Romans sure thought they were losers. But I tell you what, they are victors in Jesus Christ. Our North Korean sisters and brothers who are facing torture, they're interned in uh, uh, prison camps in North Korea. They may not seem like the victorious ones, but come Judgment Day, my guess is they're going to have a much bigger mansion than you or I are going to have. And I don't begrudge them that. They are not victims. They are victors in Christ. It's, let me just say this, just frankly put it out there. Elmira Baptist Church is not facing persecution from our government. Oppression Okay, I, you know, we can argue about where one begins and the other ends, maybe. But consider that not every government official who is making rules about religion is a tyrant and hates Christianity. Are there rulers like that in the United States? Probably. Again, I want to set aside politics. But Governor Newsom, I don't think he's one of them. I don't think Governor Newsom is antagonistic towards Christianity. I've watched some of his... Uh, speeches. I've, I've read a lot of what he's put out, and I, I don't think he is, uh, he hates Christians. He just doesn't understand. He's not, um, he's not an adversary. He's ignorant of what God has called us to do. He sort of sees us like a, a glorified bowl, bowling league. You know, it's something we get together a couple times a week, and we have a great time, and we, we sort of get our social stuff done, and he's, what he's saying is, why don't you just put that aside for a few months? Well, if we were a bowling league, we could put it aside for a few months. But we're not a bowling league. We are God's people. We are called to assemble. We're commanded to assemble. And so we must assemble. And frankly, I don't think Governor Newsom understands that. So he's not trying to persecute Christians. He's trying to do what he thinks is best in a pandemic, and he's just ignorant. He doesn't understand. We need to pray for him. But when we claim to be victims and, and complain about suffering persecution, then we're focusing, as so many people in the United States are, we are focusing on injustice, how we're not being treated right. And I, I'm warning you, a focus on injustice leads us to bitterness. And instead of focusing on injustice, I want us to focus on God's grace because God's grace leads us to gratitude. If I focus on injustice, I'm being treated unfairly, then I become bitter and angry and frustrated. God doesn't want me bitter and angry and frustrated. When I focus on God's grace, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that God gave us that beautiful slab to meet on. I'm grateful for that patch of grass in the, in the north side where the kids can meet. I'm grateful for uh, Jesse and Dwayne putting up those uh, big covers to give us a lot of shade. I'm grateful for the people that have come every Sunday and got the, 
the sound system set up and the chairs set up. And I mean, isn't God good to us? He certainly is. So we're not going to embrace victimhood. We're going to allow God's grace to flow through us during this difficult time. And we're going to show each other. And we're going to show our neighbors who are watching. They know when we're meeting. They know where we're meeting, whether we're meeting outside or inside. We're going to show them God's grace is sufficient. We're not victims. We're victors in Jesus Christ. There's another danger. Again, we're, we're thinking about how does a church address its government, interact with its government, and specifically, how does Elmira Baptist Church interact with Governor Newsom and the state of California? Because that's where these orders are coming from, not our local uh, county Board of Supervisors. Here's a second danger. The first danger was embracing victimhood and acting as if we we're being persecuted. When, yep, oppression, okay, but not, not, not persecution. I read an article just today about someone who is facing persecution in India because they've become a Christian. And their Hindu family and their Hindu community just wants nothing to do with them. Now they're homeless, jobless. That's persecution. I've got a home. I've got a job. You have a job. No one has, that I know of at Elmira Baptist Church has lost his job, lost her job because he or she is a Christian. So we're not really facing persecution. Well, let's not embrace victimhood. Let's embrace God's grace and be grateful for what God's given to us. But here's the second danger as we uh, 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 interact with our government. The second danger is the separation of of church and state is in danger of being erased. Now there's two dangers here. There's a, there's a stick and there's a carrot. There's a carrot and a stick. The stick that is dangerous, dangerously close to erasing the separation of church and state is laws and mandates whose consequences, if not intent, and again, I, I don't think there's a hateful intent here, but the consequences hinder or stop our worship. The um, request, uh, please consider discontinuing, sing discontinuing singing, comes from, again, public officials who are not Christians and, and they don't really understand how Christian worship works. We just can't worship without singing. That's not how it happens. Uh, the mayor uh, some time ago of Houston requesting all the preachers in Houston turn in their sermons just doesn't understand that we don't submit our sermons to, to a local official for approval. I mean, if they want a copy, they, you know, come get a copy, but uh, we're not hiding anything, but we don't submit them to them. That, that's dangerous because there's a stick. But I warned you Sunday, and I'll say it again, the other danger here that is dangerously close to erasing the separation between church and state is money. Offers of money to pay the salaries of Christian ministers. Because wherever money flows, control follows. Wherever money flows, control follows. Now, let me point out two things about this, this danger of the separation of church and state. We have expected, I have, you have, I know, we've talked. <laughs> uh, we've expected that the Supreme Court of the United States was going to defend our First Amendment rights to freedom of religion and going to recognize that governments cannot tell us how to worship. And we've been disappointed. I, I've been disappointed. But the Supreme Court's defense of the indefensible should not discourage us. It should remind us that our true hope of rescue does not lie with Chief Justice John Roberts and the other eight members of the United States Supreme Court. Our chief hope of rescue lies with God. Look with me at Psalm 18, verses 1 through 3. Psalm 18. This is an Old Testament passage. I'd forgotten I snuck this one in here. Psalm 18, verses 1 through 3 say this, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. 
my, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. Maybe the Lord has, in his sovereignty and wisdom, directed the minds and the thinkings of these Supreme Court justices to remind us. Now, he certainly directed them, I'm not questioning his sovereignty, but I'm looking at the purpose of his sovereignty. Maybe he's done that to remind us that he is our rock and our tower. He is the one we look to for rescue and salvation. He is the one who will defeat our enemies not the Supreme Court of the United States. And I, I don't mean this uh, in, a, in a disrespectful way to the Supreme Court. I've been disappointed with several of their rulings, most recently the one about the churches in Nevada. Uh, Justice Alito said it best. Um, Caesar's palace, referring to the gambling hall, should not have preferential treatment to Calvary Chapel. And I agree with him. That, but he couldn't get a fifth... Uh, Justice to agree with him. Only four. Uh, three others. But, but here's my point. Those disappointments should turn our thoughts again to the Lord, who is the Lord of hosts. He is the one who will defend us. But here's a second point I want to make. Chief Justice John Roberts, in his opinion about the Nevada case, was very specific. He basically said the decisions about what to do in a pandemic should be left to elected officials. Now, I disagree. I think it's a First Amendment issue, but okay. Leave it to elected officials. Vote. If we're going to leave this to elected officials, you and I, we need to vote. And we need to vote for people who are going to respect and articulate their respect for our First Amendment rights. Who you vote for in this coming election may very well determine if Christians are encouraged or if we're merely tolerated or if we're oppressed, or if we are actively persecuted. Don't just say, well, the Constitution gives us a right, because obviously, when it gets us to the, to the Supreme Court, it doesn't appear that they're going to recognize those rights. Now again, I'm not discouraged, because God's still in charge, and He's the ultimate source of our rescue, and we're going to continue to look for Him. But we need to be voting. And instead of worrying about whether the Supreme Court will protect us, we need to remember that it's the Supreme One of the universe. The Lord, God of hosts, the Almighty, the Most High God, He will rescue His people. As Psalm 18 verse 3 says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. So the danger is that this uh, church and state will be erased and that as Christians, instead of looking to God, we'll be discouraged that the state is not doing more, the government is not doing more to respect our rights. Instead of being discouraged, we need to turn to the Lord and recognize that all along He's been our, our tower, our strength, our buckler, our shield the one who protects us. But let me say this. The greatest danger in this time of crisis and pandemic, the greatest danger is not in embracing victimhood. And the greatest danger is not in the erasure of the separation of churches and, and state. Which, by the way, we as Baptists, we have been known for upholding this idea of the separation of church and state, not every denomination of Christianity would agree with me that church and state needs to be separate. Um, again, we can talk about that another time, but we very strongly believe in the separation of church and state. We say, Jesus said, Matthew 22, uh, verse 18, render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and unto God the things which are God's. That Jesus made it very clear some things belong in the realm of government, some things belong in the realm of, of church, and those two, they, they shouldn't interfere with each other. So the, but the greatest danger in this pandemic is not the erasure, the separation of church and state, and it's not that uh, we would embrace the politics of victimhood. The greatest danger in this is that Christians would attack each other. That's the greatest danger. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 
and uh, I'm going to read that in a second. But thinking, I know some churches are choosing to meet indoors against the governor's wishes. I know some churches are choosing to meet outside. I know some churches are choosing not to meet at all, or excuse me, I shouldn't say, well, in their mind, they're, they're meeting virtually, so they're not meeting, they're not assembling in one place. Uh, I know some churches that have decided that they're going to break a larger group up into much smaller groups and meet in people's homes. The danger is that we will decide that what God has led us to do is the way every church in California should do it, and those people are wrong. That's not where we need to go with this. You see, if I become sick from the COVID-19 virus and I die, I'm, I'm going to be in heaven with Jesus. I'm sorry, I'm not going to give you guys a whole lot of thought. I'm going to be too busy praising my Savior. If I get sick and I, and I don't die and I, I lay in a hospital bed, I have a wonderful opportunity to do exhibit the grace of God to the doctors and the nurses around me. And as I recover, to give God the glory for the recovery of my health. But if I attack you, or if I attack the pastor in the church down the street, and those people, those Christians over there that are not doing it right, I can, I can very easily bring dishonor to the name of Christ. Go back to the minefield. The most dangerous type of anti-personnel mine in the U.S. arsenal, and, and other countries have similar mines, it's called a Claymore mine. And it's designed when it's detonated, not just to kill the person, the soldier that it's near, but to throw dangerous shrapnel and shards of hot metal in a wide fan and kill a bunch of soldiers. And the danger for us as we face an enemy who's deceptive, face an enemy who is devious, who is devilish, I mean, he is the devil, the, the danger is not so much that we'll just fairly hold back, and the danger really isn't that as we precipitously run across, one person might be blown up. The danger is we'll set off a mine that will kill a whole bunch of Christians and defame the name of Jesus Christ. And that's what we do not want to do. Look with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Notice the word in, in verse 10 is divisions. The word in verse 11 is contentions. Satan would love for us, members of Elmira Baptist Church, to be divided about what our response ought to be. To be divided over wearing masks. To be divided over whether we should meet at all. To be divided over whether we should do this. To be divided over whether we should send our stuff over Facebook or over YouTube or over... I mean, those type of arguments are not helpful. There are theological arguments that need to be made. We certainly need to, to meet. But I'm talking about the non-theological arguments where Satan wants that Claymore mind to explode and not just take out one soldier, but take out a whole group of soldiers. Because of one soldier's careless, precipitous rush across the minefield. So here's a, here's a chance for each of us to extend grace to each other. Extend grace. I don't always understand why Christians make the choices that they do. I don't. Uh, some of you, God has led you to stay home during this time and watch the live stream. Or maybe you have children that have told you, you better stay home and watch the live stream. God bless you. I, I don't need to put pressure on you to do something you are not comfortable doing. Now, I will say, they'll come a day, by God's grace, there'll come a day when much of the danger is past. Never, it'll never be totally free of danger. Just driving to the 
church building can, can lead to accidents and death, but there'll be a, a time when it'll be mostly fear of danger, and I will. I'll, I'll be calling. I'll be visiting. Hey, it's time to come on out. But, but right now, I can extend you grace. Some of you uh, feel comfortable coming on Sunday mornings and sitting in your cars and listening, and I, again, the live stream drops and different things happen, and I, I'm sorry, but you're there in your cars. I'm comfortable with that. I can extend you grace to make that choice. Some of you, you really wish we'd just meet inside the building. Just say, I don't care what governor says, we're, we're going to go ahead and meet in the building. And you know what? I can extend you grace too. We're, we're not going to do that. We're going to be outside, but I can extend you grace as you express those sentiments to me. I, I, I hear you. But let's be considerate of each other. Let's, let's consider how we can, as, as Hebrews 10, 24 says, how we can provoke one another, one another to love and to good works. Not considered about what makes me comfortable, what I like the best, but considered of what blesses my fellow Christian, how I can show love to my neighbor, and particularly to, the, to those that are of the household of, of faith. Let's be considerate. Let's not allow this very real danger that contentions and divisions will sneak in over all these government mandates, destroy the, the beautiful unity that Elmira Baptist Church has. The ability to flexibly change our plans, Behind the scenes, some of you, you ladies that have been helping with the children's church, you know, we're going to meet outside. Okay, we'll do that. Um, Ron Abelos coming early and helping set up the sound. Okay, I'll do that. There's a lot of things that my point is, there's a lot of things you're not seeing where people are being so flexible to just help. Because they want to maintain that unity. Let's not sacrifice that on the altar of my own opinion and what I want to do. Because the greatest danger from the pandemic and, and the crisis that it has precipitated, the greatest danger is not that the constitutional separation of, of church and state will be erased. It's, it's not that we'll embrace victimhood and lose the, the, the victory we have in Christ Jesus. The greatest danger is that we'll end up fighting among ourselves We'll end up accusing each other and, and being impatient with each other during a time that calls for more grace and more patience. So instead of this pandemic becoming a source of division, let again, let it become a source of God's grace. God's grace is sufficient for all things. What did Paul say? I asked God three times to remove this thorn in the flesh. And he said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. That's in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. Therefore, he says, he goes on to say verse 10, Therefore will I most gladly uh, rejoice, I'm missing a verb, in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That's what we want to embrace during this time. It's difficult. I don't like get any more than you do, but, but let's keep that in mind. The greatest danger we face is a loss of the unity, uh, divisions and strife and contentions that would bring dishonor to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you a couple updates on your prayer sheet. So if you have that, uh, go ahead and get that out. I talked to Carol Adams today. She mentioned a coworker co-worker who's about my age, named Shelly, who is now on hospice care. Uh, cancer has metastasized through her body, and uh, frankly, Carol said if we don't pray for her tonight, probably by next Wednesday, um, she won't be with us. Now, she is a Christian, and um, we, we can pray for her healing, but Carol wasn't necessarily suggesting we must pray for her healing. Just pray for God's peace and comfort during this difficult time. And also for Shelley's parents. Their last name is Shoning, S-C-H-O-E-N-I-N-G. The Shonings, obviously it's hard when you lose a child. 
Uh, Carol knows that pain personally and asks that we particularly play, pray for Shelley and for her parents, the Shonings. There's a, a, a few new ones and a couple of things to update you. Uh, Ray Smith has been having some painful trouble with his leg. The, the list on the sick. And then some personal news for 20. Ruth Plunkett has asked us to pray for wisdom. Her son that she lives with is going to be doing some traveling, so she needs to make a decision about where she's going to be while he's away and asked us to pray. Um, an update uh, under the sick number 30. Came through the surgery well, praise the Lord, and doing somewhat better. Also, my uncle, Bob Dean, uh, he's come out of surgery. He's home now and uh, recovering, so pray for him also. Just double-check my notes here. Yeah. And don't forget to pray for our local, state, and federal officials to have wisdom. What they do does impact us. And again, know that any of them uh, hate Christians. Uh, I think inform them. And tasting, and I'm not saying any of us go to wine tastings, I'm just saying, you know, Governor Newsom has some, uh, a winery, if I understand, and maybe he thinks we're sort of like this wine tasting, we sort of go because we enjoy it, no, we go because God commands it, and let's pray that they'll have wisdom as they make decisions that impact all of us. God is with us while we are with him. And if we'll seek him, we will find him. I quoted last night several times to a man I was witnessing to Hebrews 11:6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, for they that come to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I hope that you're diligently seeking the Lord. You'll see me again tomorrow at 11 o'clock.